It's Dr. Sabrina Siegel here to introduce a brand new special series brought to you by the NEI podcast. Welcome to the Psychopharmastology Show. In this special series, Dr. Andrew Cutler interviews Dr. Stephen Stahl on the most controversial, novel, and exciting topics in psychopharmacology today. Every three months, we will address a different theme in psychopharmacology. Each theme is split into three parts with one part released each month. This next theme is on practical psychopharmacology. This theme focuses on the brand new book by Dr. Stephen Stahl and Dr. Joseph Goldberg titled Practical Psychopharmacology, Translating Findings from Evidence-Based Trials into Real-World Clinical Practice. Dr. Goldberg even joins us in this series. Let's listen in to part one, Placebo and Nocebo Effects in Psychopharmacology, with Dr. Joseph Goldberg. Welcome to another episode of the Psychopharmacology Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about placebo and nocebo effects, which will be very interesting. And with me, I have two famous authors. I have with me Dr. Joe Goldberg, a good friend of mine and a renowned researcher and clinician. And of course, Dr. Stahl, who you may have heard of, has authored a book or two in his career. But the information that we're going to be talking about today is coming from a book that was just published with Joe and Steve as the authors. It's called Practical Psychopharmacology, Translating Findings from Clinical Trials into Real-World Clinical Practice. And I just, I really think this is an exciting book, uh, sort of the culmination of conversations I've had with Joe over the years and the culmination of his career. And as someone who does clinical trials and treats patients, I always said that being an investigator has made me a better clinician because it forced me to be more rigorous in my thinking and to think about measurement and rating scales and what kind of patient matching up to what kind of treatment. Joe, tell me a little bit about the genesis of this book. Well, Andy, thank you for the introduction. So it really did come from conversations with you and others over the years um, among colleagues who are both clinicians, psychopharmacologists, and investigators. And I, I really wanted to meld the, the joint mindset that goes behind how you would think about a patient and approach a patient if you're, you know, let's say a clinician who's just seeing patients one after another and thinking about diagnoses and h- how to pick a medicine and balance side effects and then on to the next patient, which is very different, I think, from how a clinical investigator thinks about a patient, formally assesses almost in their head doing a skid, a structured interview diagnostically to determine if criteria are met for a suspected diagnosis or multiple diagnoses and the symptoms in terms of their constellations, their number, their durations, are there other factors that might be getting in the way? Are there medical comorbidities? There's a whole range of things that investigators think about in deciding this is a specimen for a research study and now I'm going to use drug X uh, with an intended purpose to see if it's going to affect some result that I have in mind. And those are almost two very disparate mindsets. So I really wanted to put these together, drawing on my own experience and and that of colleagues such as you all, as clinicians and investigators, to really try to amalgamate the clinical trials literature, which has now grown tremendously. A book like this, I don't think really could have been written 20 years ago. Now we have lots and lots of clinical trials in various disease states, and we have concepts that help us think through the candidacy of a patient for a given drug, and to go beyond just what's your diagnosis and what's the treatment or what's an algorithm. Here's the algorithm for depression, the algorithm for schizophrenia, but rather to, Steve likes to say, you don't treat large groups of patients, you treat every patient as an individual Mm -hmm. and you tailor the treatment to Mm -hmm. that one patient based on their characteristics, which is really exactly what an investigator does. And then you try to not change more than one variable at a time and you use an adequate trial so there's a whole mindset that goes into this, and that's really what, what the book's about. Okay, great. We're going to be Actually, doing... Actually, uh, Andy, yeah. I've got a little bit different take on this. I, I think this is not so fancy like Joe said. I think this is my frustrated second career to be a CSI, <laughs> a blind scene investigator. I've always wanted to do that. So instead, I became a CNSI. <laughs> a central nervous system investigator. So I go to the scene of the crime, which is the disease, and investigate it and have, it's much more fun to actually think about it that way. Be boring seeing patient after patient, and especially difficult ones, 
this is a great approach. It's a lot of fun. You can add evidence to it. And another thing that Joe brought up, but he didn't mention when we were talking, is a thing called bespoke. I don't know if any of you have British background, but do you know what a bespoke suit is? It's a classical 18th and 19th century, before they were actually manufacturing, tailored suit on Savile Row. It fits you exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is could also be called bespoke psychopharmacology, right, Joe? Yeah, one size fits one. <laughs> Very nice. And you could even think about the notion, uh, I'm going to come back at you with CSI, with cl clinical trialism, N of one trials, right? So the idea that every patient presents to you their data and the detective, the psychopharmacological or psych psychiatric detective in all of us makes hypotheses and says, gee, I wonder what it means that you talk so fast or that you have less sleep or that your thoughts are somewhat disorganized. So it should pique your interest and curiosity. And this is what makes psychiatry fun for, for so many of us, I think, is you're trying to unfold a story and put all these pieces together. And then the pharmacology follows. Yeah. This is really interesting. I appreciate the explanations of the kind of genesis of this. We're going to actually be doing a three-part series here. We're going to have three podcasts that derive from this book and talk about each uh, the three different chapters. So today, really, we're focusing on one of the chapters, uh, which is the placebo and nocebo effect. So let's get started. Just jump in. What is the difference between placebo effect and regression to the mean? That's a very philosophically profound question. Let me see <laughs> if I can tackle it. So let's start in reverse. So regression to the mean is this statistical concept that happens when multiple events happen over time. Let's take baseball as the best example. You get up to the plate, you're first at bat of the season, and you get on base. And then you're second at bat, you get on base. And you're third at bat, you get on base. And now you're batting a 1,000. The, the odds of that staying over the season are, are, are pretty close to zero because over time, things start to balance out. Mm -hmm. And so successes are met with setbacks and on average, whatever average means, after enough iterations or at-bats, you'll get a better sense of what your real on-base percentages or your real batting averages. Over time, it is thought that when we uh, treat patients with any treatments and, and we're gauging successes, certain patients will have robust responses, certain mm -hmm. patients will have no responses and everything mm -hmm. in between. And oh, over time, just like a batter who starts out batting 750 or 1,000 may wind up at 240 if you're on mm -hmm. the Yankees. You'll get, you'll get a better sense of what their real batting average is. And in much the same way over time, when we use pharmacologies, we will get a, a clearer sense of the reliability of our interventions. So, right. So you're also can, increasing randomness to some degree because yeah. you can have randomly get three hits, for instance. Exactly. So regression to the mean would speak to the validation of reality over time, how reliable is something? And now, if I can bring in this notion of effect sizes, which is another important point in, in the book, is we don't just ask, does this drug work better than a placebo? Or does this drug work better than that drug? But rather, how clinically meaningful is, is the impact of the drug? And a revelation to me when I was working on, on the book was go, there, there are tables here just going through the effect sizes, how clinically meaningful is the impact Lots and lots of different drugs. And what really struck me was a lot of our pharmacologies, while they're better than placebo, aren't head and shoulders astoundingly better than placebo. And in fact, they range quite a bit. We have drugs with very large effect sizes, such as intravenous ketamine for depression or certain formulations of amphetamine for ADHD. And then we have drugs that work and are better than placebos, but not by a lot. So there's drugs like buspirone or even lamotrigine and bipolar depression that, that have effect sizes. And an effect size really means how meaningfully different is an intervention from a placebo. So placebo is not no treatment. And mm -hmm. across different disorders, you can identify a placebo response, say, in major depression. About 40% of placebo takers get better with major depression. In post-traumatic stress disorder, we see also about a 40% placebo response rate. So you always have to do better than the placebo response rate to, to judge efficacy. And a nocebo, placebo is a benefit from a drug, a nocebo is, is a detriment mm -hmm. that's attributed to an inactive substance. So if a placebo can have a 40% success rate for efficacy in major depression, we can similarly ask, what's the chance of having a side effect? 
mm-hmm. from a placebo, and, and that's mm-hmm. called the nocebo. So it's a little right. different than regression to the mean, but it's a related concept. That's why I say it's a really very probing question, because it speaks to getting rid of randomness and really judging how can it be that if I give you an inactive substance mm-hmm. and you have major depression, one out of 20 people is going to uh, is going to drop out of treatment because of a side effect from the placebo. And as many as two out of three are going to have a side effect from a placebo. So the clinician slash investigator is constantly trying to ferret out when the patient complains of this or this. Is it regression to the mean? Mm -hmm. Is it a nocebo effect? Is it a real Mm -hmm. pharmacodynamic effect? And this goes into the whole calculus of thinking through what the heck's going on with the patient. And of course, the placebo effect is real. And that's part of the reason why in the U.S. anyway, and it's funny, it's only the U.S. Other countries don't do this. But in the U.S., we have to beat placebo. Otherwise, it could just be a placebo effect. And why expose the patient to a risk? But there's many things that affect placebo response, aren't there? Yeah. So we can almost hand in hand talk about what goes into a placebo response and what goes into a nocebo response. And Mm -hmm. this too is what I would call one of the finer points that we try to bring out in the book, things that you may take for granted. Patient comes to you, you give them a medicine, and they're better in a week. What do you conclude? Mm -hmm. What do you conclude? Joe Goldberg's charisma. That's what I get. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, the collective enthusiasm, right? Mm -hmm. And, And this is partly why placebo is not is not no treatment. 40% is a huge response rate with placebo. And that's not that's just right. major depression. You know, Andy, I mean, it, it, my, my research interest has mostly been in bipolar disorder. And part of the challenge in finding efficacious treatments for bipolar depression isn't simply an effective drug. It's that a, a real irony is that bipolar depression is hard to treat. And yet placebo can work in up to 40% of patients, right. maybe in part, though, because the natural course of the illness involves cycling out or because just the vicissitudes that we see. So if, if I give you a drug and you're better in a week, maybe that's Joe Goldberg charisma. Maybe that's, wow, this drug must have a big effect size and it mm-hmm. really beats placebo. Or, or maybe it's the random noise that we see, an expectancy bias mm-hmm. and nonspecific factors that go into the placebo effect around really expectations on the patient's part what their what their past treatment and, and illness burden has been like. So certain things will squish down the placebo effect. Mm-hmm. And this was another, I'll say, revelation to me in writing the book. Certain things will really suppress a placebo response. Probably the most powerful predictor of a non-placebo response is baseline severity. Mm-hmm. If you have very severe depression, you're not going anywhere <laughs> for right. the placebo. If you have mild to moderate depression, placebo effects start to creep up. And this is where we Mm -hmm. don't see a difference from active drug. So Mm -hmm. it's been said when people debate, are antidepressants really effective or not? There's been things in the media about they're no better than placebo. You have to take into consideration things that will influence the distinction between drug and placebo. And low, mild to moderate levels of depression bring out a higher placebo response rate. Uh, High severity will tend to suppress a high placebo response rate. And that, that's talked mm-hmm. about quite a bit in the book. Other things like duration of illness, chronicity, age and onset. You could say sicker people don't get better with placebos as a, maybe as a rule of, of thumb. They also don't get as much better with active drugs. But this is where the investigator is always asking, how does the drug differ from a placebo in terms of expectancy? You talk about Joe. Let me I mean, just yeah. add here, you know, Joe, there's interesting though, placebos are neurochemical in many cases. Placebo response to pain is reversible by opioid antagonists. Yep. There's placebo in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease gets better on placebo. Mm-hmm. And you can actually show dopamine release in the brain of a placebo responding Parkinson patient. What's going on there that you're actually neurotransmitters? And, and maybe it has to do with expectancy effects. Uh, because there's expectancy effects that we've talked about and we should talk about here about Expecting bad outcomes means people get side effects here you know, no matter what you do. But something's going on in the brain. It's not just all in your head. It might actually be in your brain. <laughs> Is, isn't the brain an interesting organ? Think about you know if you could block a placebo effect with an opioid antagonist, or for that matter, you and I have interest in things like pharmacogenetics. If you could identify a single nucleotide polymorphism that's relevant in the opiate system, for example, could that pick out someone that's more prone to have a placebo response because they are more likely to have the endorphin effects of a placebo? This is, to me, 
you know, the interface of, wow, this is fascinating stuff. It, it rejuvenates my interest in, in wanting to be a psychiatrist and a psychopharmacologist in the first place, with also an eagerness for the field to catch up to this sort of wonderment and gee whiz quality. Because you're right, placebo is doing something in the brain. There, there are these famous studies by uh, Walter Brown, a psychopharmacologist, doing open trials of placebo for major depression. So think about this. I'm going to give you an inactive substance. I'm going to tell you it's an inactive mm -hmm. substance. There, there are research protocols where the IRB language will say things like, you are being given a substance that has no active medicine in it, but has been shown to be helpful to people with your problem before. So how you couch this and how you frame it, you know, it, it's not propaganda. It's an accurate statement. Placebos can help people. They don't have active medicine in it. And they may have side effects. You have to warn people about the side effects right, of placebo. And in, in Walter Brown's studies, he's seen antidepressant response rates of 60 to 70 percent with open label placebo when the patient knows mm -hmm. they're getting a placebo. So what is that? Is that the ritualization? Is that the charisma? Is that you have a, a very attentive and hopefully informed interviewer who's asking you all the questions that, right. let's say, bring in some of the psychotherapeutic elements? It's right. we have to when we think of psychopharmacologists, we're asking, how do we go above and beyond that baseline that comes from placebo? It's the power of the mind over the body. And also expectation bias is the number one determinant of treatment outcome. If the patient expects to get better, they will. So it's all the things we're talking about. But I think most importantly, you're right, placebo ain't nothing. It does induce real biologic changes. And well, part of what I'm trying to do with this a book is to say, if you're really an ineffective psychopharmacologist, all you do have is placebo. And mm -hmm. so there's, and, mm -hmm. but if you're too effective a psychopharmacologist, all you have is drugs. <laughs> and so what we want to do is have the magic of, of combining those two to get the best exactly. outcome. Exactly. Yeah. I always say in the real world, placebo is my friend and in clinical trials, it's my mortal enemy. You know, yeah, real world, I want to enhance placebo response, right? That's a really interesting distinction you just make, Andy. An investigator is doing everything in their power to minimize the placebo effect, and a real-world clinician welcomes the placebo effect sure. and will do everything possible to try to amplify the effect. But that's a counterpoint to, to the mindset of an investigator and a mm -hmm. clinician. But there's lots of ways, I think, that you draw patients in, playing off the psychology of things. One thing I've found as a clinician is when you explain things to patients and you don't just say, let's give you, let's say, I don't know, an SNRI plus an atypical antipsychotic or plus mirtazapine or some combination, and there's a rationale and you tell a story to the patient. We're going to go after your ailment with tactical warfare. And in ever so basic terms, I'll say these two drugs work in complementary ways, the same way your internist might give you two blood pressure medicines mm -hmm. or your infectious disease doctor might put two or even three antibiotics together. And it's not random. It's not trial and error. We, we think we know enough about what's going on in brain circuits to say, I want to influence this monoamine pathway, or I, I would like to try to influence this glutamate pathway. So we now have a little more knowledge than we had 20 years ago to say, I'm not just throwing pills around. I'm actually trying to effect some tactical response. In my experience, whether that nets an effect or not, patients are very compelled by the notion that the, 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 the person that's taking care of them knows what they're doing and can at least, <laughs> what I tell my patients, I can promise you a rationale. I can tell you a reason. It's not arbitrary why we're going to put things together. Mm -hmm. And, and that makes, I think, for what, what Steve would call the expectancy bias, which applies to the active drug as well as to the placebo. I think competency is a very powerful thing. And also, do you care about me? And I think this level of attention and asking questions, the curiosity you demonstrate, uh, this demonstrates caring. And I think that's powerful. I mean, you think about people in the pre-modern era, doctors, what did they do 100 years ago? They basically cared and, and shared the experience. And I think they also knew what the natural course of the illness was. So one mm -hmm. of the things we did in this book is there's lots of quotations. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorites is by Voltaire, mm -hmm. which was, it is, the wise, uh, it is the wise physician who amuses his patient while letting nature take its course. <laughs> so that doesn't mean you stand around when someone's septic <laughs> or in V-fib, but it does mean that you're aware of the time course of things. So let's go back to bipolar disorder for a second. The average mood episode lasts about 13 weeks. We know that from pharma, from um, observational studies. So 
You don't just come to me and say, I have bipolar depression. What drug should I take? I ask you, among other things, how long has this been going on? If you say to me, oh, I've been depressed a good couple of months, that's different from you've been depressed for a good couple of weeks because the natural course of your illness is going to move us in a direction that's different. Or if you've had rapid cycling, that's going to influence the outcome too. So before I jump in with any pharmacology and not just the, the TLC and the caring, which is vitally important, it's also knowing something about the tailoring. This is to Steve's comment about the bespoke. A rapid cycler in their seventh week of depression is very different from a non-rapid cycler in their first week of depression. The natural course is going to be different. And so I can't necessarily ascribe consequences to my interventions without being aware of those factors. Fascinating. It's interesting you mentioned Voltaire because there's a, I have a favorite Voltaire quote too, which is also relevant here. And that is to generalize is to be a fool to particularize is the sole virtue. Sorry, to particularize is the sole virtue. And so this is again, talking about the individual and the end of one, if you will, yeah. whereas clinical trials give us averages of patients. What's, what's always fascinating to me though, we, we touched on the nocebo effect before. So back to the, the brain is this mysterious dark organ. How can it be that I give you an inert substance and you get worse? Hmm. So, so imagine saying to a patient, I'm going to quote from here, uh, quote myself. I'm going to give you something that's got more than a 10% chance of causing you headache, nausea, dizziness, insomnia, sedation, weakness, malaise, and anxiety. You're going to take that. <laughs> I mean, those are the most common nocebo effects with a placebo. So in a sense, if you're being transparent or thinking about disclosing to a patient what you're going to do, and patients are always worried, first do no harm. Is this drug going to give me side effects? Am I going to gain weight? Am I going to get drowsy? You tell patients, you know, placebos cause side effects. Water causes side effects. So the baseline we're starting from, just like the placebo benefit, the placebo detriment, if you've got about a two out of three chance of, of having some side effect from just an inert substance, and these are the most common ones, part of what I need to do when I'm assessing the patient isn't just deciding what's their diagnosis and what's their illness burden and their severity and all that, but also what's their physiological proneness to somatic experiences? Because we know things like you mentioned expectancy bias before. Mm -hmm. If I expect I'm going to get going to get better, that'll help. If I expect I'm going to get hurt, that's a negative expectancy bias. Do you ever have a patient come your way and they say, oh, I'm, and Steve knows about this. We, I think we've shared some patients. Every drug I've taken gives me problems and side effects. I'm very mm -hmm. sensitive to side effects. Mm -hmm. I now throw yeah. the gauntlet down. Steve, you, I think you and I both have, have shared some patients over time where that's right. been the case. And what do you do? Do you just say, let's try the next drug and cross our fingers? <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, it's been very difficult, and I'm sure everybody listening in here has seen patients like that. It's about expectancy, and it's not easy to change someone's long-term expectancy, but if you can, that's going to really leverage your outcomes. And so sometimes you take people off all their meds. Sometimes you use TMS, shouldn't have medication-induced side effects. So there's various ways to do it. I've even gone so far as to have commercial pharmacies put placebo in a pill and then blind both the patient and I. And after a week of alternating which day was placebo, which is drug, actually reveal on the other side that the patient was having side effects to placebo. And so in be able to try to talk somebody out of the fact that they've had often very a traumatic experience, quite frankly, they've had a horrible side effect, in fact, and then all of a sudden they expect everything to have at least some side effect and then and in fact, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, that's a really good point, Steve. I hadn't thought about that. It's almost like a conditioning effect if you have a bad yeah. experience in the beginning. Keeping up with the latest in psychiatry shouldn't be a struggle. SynovianFieldMedical.com is a new website for clinicians where you can find a library of free hand-selected resources such as videos and infographics on important psychiatry topics. You can request an educational program for your practice or connect with Synovian medical professionals in your area. Synovian wants to help you get all of your psychiatry questions answered. Go to SynovianFieldMedical.com and explore what Synovian has to offer. 
it's also interesting if you're in a clinical trial, another difference between clinical trials and the real world. In a clinical trial, we give people these extensive informed consent forms that go through a list of every possible side effect that you might have. And sometimes I think that plants a seed in somebody's mind too. I wish we could take the internet away. I'm treating a patient right now mm-hmm. who, no matter what happens, we chase side effects from one to another when he develops mm-hmm. side effects after weeks on a medicine. And that's usually the other clue is that most side effects are acute. Some are late evolving, but you don't get them and take them away and get them and take them away over the course of months and months. But they're real to the patient, so they can make you uh, stop taking your meds. And so I guess the the issue would be to try to set as much as possible expectancy at the beginning and tell people stay off the internet. (laughs) I'm I'm going to counter that a little bit with the framing of, I guess I'll call it the therapeutic alliance, which is it's you and me, the patient and me against the world. And so by all means, get on the internet, find out whatever you want, go to whatever unmonitored website you want. Just come back to me with what you find and let's you and me be a team and figure this out because the world's a scary place. And the one thing I can promise you, and this may go back to something Andy was saying before about you know, the, the sense of, it's almost like what I'll call Winnicottian psychopharmacology, which is creating a holding environment and a safe and caring environment that I'm not going to let anything bad happen to you, or I'm going to do my best to make sure that nothing bad can happen to you. So I'm your wingman and the world is a scary place and all kinds of terrible things can happen. And when a patient comes to you with a laundry list of the myriad bad things that can happen, and we've all have patients who come in with reams of paper and I read on the internet this can happen, this can happen. It doesn't, in my experience, go very far to try to sort of rationally say, ah, but look, if you go online, I guarantee you can Google any side effect with any drug, you will find hits. Hmm. Or if you look in the package insert, my favorite, one of my favorite sections in the PI, package insert, is side effects that are either infrequent or rare. Infrequent are are less than one in a hundred and rare is between one, one in a hundred and one in a thousand. You'll never take another drug again, I promise you. If you look at things like fluoxetine can cause aortic aneurysms, can cause sepsis, appendicitis. It's fascinating reading. And in a way, you and me against the world is saying, I have to put this in context for you. You can get hit by a truck after you take sertraline. What's the likelihood of that happening? What are the factors that make it more likely or less likely? Or if you take an antidepressant and you get more suicidal, is that a nocebo effect? Is that just the natural worsening of your depression? If you have depression and you take an antidepressant and you gain five pounds, is that iatrogenic or have I restored your appetite because your depression took it away? So I think we're always trying to collaborate with the patient and saying, I'm here to create a safe environment as best as I can and ferret through with you the expectancies that you have. And I'm not going to challenge you. If you tell me that amphetamine puts you to sleep, I'm not going to argue with you. If you tell me that Tylenol makes your fever go up. I'm not going to say that's impossible, but I am going to do everything in my power to to try to make you feel safe and and to point out things that are likely to be helpful and minimize any risk. Or any convulsions cause seizures. This was thought to be ridiculous until it was found that it may actually be true in certain people. So sometimes we learn things. So I never say never with a patient like you're saying. Also, speaking of Treatment Alliance, there was a study several years ago looking at various psychotherapeutic techniques for depression. And what they found was the outcomes didn't matter so much which school or discipline of therapy you were doing. It was the quality and nature of the therapeutic relationship, the therapeutic alliance that really mattered. Yeah. And that really mucks things up for the investigator. I I think I remember the study you're talking about. I've been involved in clinical trials where, you know, for the research assistants, there are stipulations on what you can and can't say mm-hmm. and how much time you can spend with the patient. So you have to say, you can't say things to the patient like that must have been very difficult for you and how are you managing you know, The issue of time you spend is very interesting because as placebo response has been creeping up over the years in clinical trials. And part of the reason I think is that we our, our visits get longer and longer now as they pile on more and more different procedures. And so a typical visit now can last most of the day, four to six hours. And the longer you spend with somebody who's caring and paying attention to you and caring for you, I think that's going to drive placebo response to some degree. Does that make sense? A colleague of mine, totally. A colleague of mine at Payne Whitney years ago published a study when I was there. She just looked at Hamilton scores before and after a skid, Mm. a day apart. Just giving a skid cut your Hamilton depression score down 
not by half, but, but pretty high. Mm -hmm. So there's something yeah. about what we do in our field above and beyond just data gathering that, that's therapeutic. Maybe it's the, the uh, Heisenberg principle. You become part mm -hmm. of the system and so now you've changed it. Mm -hmm. But this makes me worry a little bit about interpreting the results of clinical trials. With placebo going up, sometimes that's going to, the effect size obviously comes down. Yeah. So it's sometimes hard to interpret. And that's well, like some people to say since this effect size looks fairly small in drug placebo differences in some trials, particularly of depression, mm -hmm. that it's all baloney and the drugs don't work at all and it's all placebo. And so it's gone to extremes. So there's some naysayers out there that say antidepressants don't work. It's all, you know, made yeah. up by psychiatrists. Yeah, exactly. What do we know about issues of personality and placebo response? Or you also mentioned genetic correlates. Do we yeah. have any information on those? Yeah. So the, you know, the way we measure personality could probably be much better than it is. People talk about traits like neuroticism or mm -hmm. introversion or harm avoidance, or what's called an internal versus an external locus of control, which is actually a term because it mm -hmm. speaks to how much do you think that the things that happen to you in life are the result of external factors beyond your control, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I feel some sense of agency over the things mm -hmm. that happen to me, and mm -hmm. I make my own destiny and fate. So these are some of the, let's say, traits and temperamental or personality characteristics that will go into, well, response in general and placebo response in particular, people that have a very high external locus of control, a real sense of passivity, somebody who comes along and says, I took this pill, it didn't do anything for me, or I, I tried that treatment, it, it, it didn't help me, and convey a sense that the world just happens to them and... Mm -hmm. That you don't really have a chance to talk about, did you take it every day? Were you taking any other medicines that could conflict with it? What's your alcohol intake? Are you smoking weed? Mm -hmm. So the many factors that will pharmacokinetically and pharmacodynamically influence the drug response can sometimes fall by the wayside among people that, that may have lifestyle factors that will interfere with drug response and then attribute it to the drug didn't work or the treatment was ineffective rather than mm -hmm. the system that was going on at the time didn't work. So we, we get a little more nervous about people that are ex external locus of control, the sort of high neuroticism to use that old term, which is, is really just an, an archaic way of speaking about high anxiety and expectancy that something bad's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So this almost gets into a cognitive reframing. Mm -hmm. What's the point of trying the next drug? The last four didn't work and they almost become nihilistic. Mm -hmm. Or I've had a side effect with everything I've taken. How will this be different? Or if you like, Dr. Stahl, I've been to 10 doctors, including uh, Dr. Cutler, Drs. Cutler and Goldberg. How are you going to be better than the last <laughs> one? It, it sets up an expectancy that's a no-win situation. So I think you have to size up those expectancies in your own mind. And, and humility becomes very important, which, which means saying, mm -hmm. let's acknowledge you've been on many treatments if they've been appropriate treatments, if they have been adequately dosed and adherence has been good and there hasn't been interference from substances or other interactions or, you know, let's invoke pharmacogenetics. Somebody gave you only 2D6 substrates and you're a 2D6 poor metabolizer. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. partly I'm trying to figure out as a detective, a CSI, CS, CSNI person, are there any, any mitigating factors that will account for here's why you didn't get better before your poor metabolizer and they've been giving mm -hmm. you drugs that go the wrong pathway or you're getting pro drugs that don't get broken down or you're taking drugs with pk interaction so a good psychopharmacologist knows all that but then beyond that if somebody is just predisposed or, or tells you things that that violate pharmacological rules like somebody says i'm a poor gabapentin metabolizer i think my pharmacogenetics yeah. need to get tested and we know gee, gabapentin doesn't get metabolized. It's excreted, it doesn't change, yeah. get metabolized. <laughs> yeah. Or you're a poor metabolizer for a certain substrate, but the drug you took was through a different pathway. Mm -hmm. So a good knowledge of pharmacokinetics mm -hmm. and pharmacogenetics bears on this will help you think through th this does or doesn't make sense. When someone tells you a story that doesn't add up, that's where you start to worry, I, I should expect placebo effects. And on the flip side of that, the good CSNI doctor says, oh my, I, I had this happen about a month ago. Somebody came to me and they were truly on three 
2D6 substrates, and then it get better. And I said, well, gee, this almost sounds like a no-brainer. I don't even have to do pharmacogenetics. Let's give you a 3A4 drug or, <laughs> or something that's not even metabolized just to find out, or, or, or let's switch you to a drug that's, that's not metabolized. So, so that would be a, a way of teasing apart, is there a placebo expectancy issue or a true pharmacodynamic or pharmacokinetic explanation mm -hmm. for why someone's not getting better? And, and that, again, that goes to the fun of teasing out the detective story. I've always said to be a good clinician is to be curious. And, you know, getting back to what Steve said earlier, to be curious makes it fun again. And it'd be better than to just sit in your office seeing patient after patient. What do you think, Steve? Can we introduce curiosity back into clinical care? I think it is the single most important factor to enjoying your job. I think that when I actually lecture and I can see people coming in burned out and tired from a long day, if you can reignite their curiosity and reacquaint them with why they went into mental health as a profession and the absolute fascination there is for the brain, this helps drive your attitude. And a positive attitude actually spills over to the patient. I've often said that when you are practicing short visits, and sometimes some practices have a lot of that, and all of us have some of that, the one thing we can always do is educate, destigmatize, and set those expectations. We've been talking about this whole po podcast. And setting expectations by being optimistic and uh, really feeling like uh, there's a chance you're going to get better, that kind of thing, and that you're going to tolerate the medicine and it's going to work, those sorts of things are very important. And you can't say that unless you believe it, mm -hmm. at least with conviction you can't say it. And so, mm -hmm. therefore, your curiosity leads you to wow, this is going to be cool to try. I really think we got a good chance this is going to do. Yeah, I think so. I've always thought that placebo effects wore off over time. Joe, are placebo effects fleeting or can they be persistent? So there's actually debate about that. The lore has always been that a placebo effect is transient and that's why they don't last. And depending on the duration of a study, you, you might see the loss of placebo effect over time and then you get a failed trial. It varies by diagnoses. There's actually some literature looking at major depression, which shows that over the course of time in treating major depression, for example, a majority of patients who are placebo responders actually, contrary to what you might think, will hold on to their response mm -hmm. for, for some number of weeks. There, there was a, mm -hmm. a meta-analysis with eight randomized trials, which showed that about 80% of um, placebo responders remained responders at 12 weeks. They didn't lose their response. Um, on the other hand, other disorders, you, you may not see that. So panic disorder, for instance, is an example mm -hmm. of a condition where you might see a very fast initial response. I'm better within seconds of swallowing the pill. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and then if you come back a month later, it, it's mm -hmm. gone. So I don't know if anxiety presents itself as a moderator mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that it's been looked at as formally as one might wish. But my own hypothesis is that if there's a lot of anxiety and apprehension, the, the prescriber is going to have to work very hard to sustain the placebo effect. Yeah. It's a little bit like keeping a child entertained in that <laughs> yeah. you have to constantly be sort of feeding it and saying, ah, oh, this is happening and that's happening, rather than the passivity of, okay, you're better, bye bye Because placebo responses probably require an anxiolytic component. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I would offer the suggestion that if a lot of anxiety is present, you may see a, a fading response compared to the absence of anxiety. Yeah, and those anxiety patients do appear to have more of the nocebo effect too, at yeah. least in my experience. Another question, what's the difference between active and inactive placebo effect? Ah, this is a really great and important point. And it also gets into how come some trials are, are failed, mm -hmm. that is, placebo work too well. So if I give you a, a drug that has sedation and cognitive dulling and weight gain and, and a bunch of really obvious side effects versus an inactive placebo, it won't take you very long to know if you think you're getting the real drug or the placebo. So to counteract what's been called the, the side effect cueing phenomenon, some clinical trials will deliberately use a, a placebo that, that either has side effects in it. So for example, if I'm going to give you ketamine, I, I, I probably don't want to just give you placebo or saline as the comparator, I might want to give you a benzo or, or a midazolam. Mm -hmm. or, uh, there was a famous study with omega-3 fatty acids. Many of us know from years ago, 
looking in, in bipolar disorder, and the observation was made, you, you know the minute you put the pill in your mouth if it's fish or not. <laughs> so if you could inadvertently break the blind if the active right. drug that you're giving is fairly side effect laden, but the placebo is not. So an active placebo would usually be something to try to throw you off. And they often ask research participants, do you think you're on drug or placebo? And to the extent patients say, yeah, I'm pretty sure I was on the placebo, and they were, but lower response rates. Some people also associate a side effect with a sign they're getting better. No pain, no gain. Right. Right. Active placebos are in some ways a, a measure to try to minimize the placebo effect by giving the patient a, a sort of an obscuring of the, the chance to break the blind by mistake. Got it. Yeah, I've sometimes, I'll be honest, in clinical work, sometimes I've used that to my advantage and said, oh, that's a good thing you have this side effect. It means the drug's working. I'll tell you, when I got my second COVID vaccine and I had no side effects, I was really disappointed, even though intellectually I Mm -hmm. know Mm -hmm. that doesn't (laughs) foretell anything about my immune response other than maybe I'm old. But I was envious of all my younger friends who said, oh, I really felt sick for 36 hours afterwards. So Mm -hmm. we we attach importance to side effects. And sometimes that importance is proof that it's working. Yeah. Okay. A little bit of a gear shift here. What are potential problems with drug discontinuation effects and the relationship to placebo? Yeah. So we often do what we might call iterative psychopharmacology. I think it's rarer and rarer nowadays for psychiatrists to have a, a fresh patient untreated and you start a drug and you can judge its effects. So depending on what the patient's been taking when they come to you and if you, you know, try to elaborately sketch out a plan for what you're going to stop and what you're going to continue and what you're going to add, polypharmacy being so common across disorders nowadays, we have to be mindful of the extent to which stopping something you had been on is itself an intervention. So Mm -hmm. if someone's been on let's say, oh, of a very antihistaminergic drug or uh, mm-hmm. a, a short half-life serotonergic drug mm-hmm. uh, or, or something that, that, that we have to take into account, the drug discontinuation effects, that is going to make it harder to know in the next couple of weeks what's going to happen. If someone's been on lithium and they abruptly stop it, for instance, there's research to suggest that may portend a higher chance of relapse than if they gradually stop it. Mm-hmm. And we think about SSRI discontinuation syndromes. Mm-hmm. So th- this gets into maybe more the art than the science of drug transitions. There's a chapter on the book about this and the ways in which the half-life of the outgoing drug matters mm-hmm. or the potential pharmacokinetics. Mm-hmm. If I'm giving you a drug that inhibits the metabolism of an enzyme, substrate's going to go through that enzyme next. It'll bear on whether I want to gradually stop, abruptly stop, mm-hmm. or what to anticipate. So these are all factors that have to come into play. If I'm going to, I try to change one thing at a time, so mm-hmm. you're not obscuring many things at mm-hmm. once, obviously. But we always have to consider if you've just stopped, let's say, an SSRI, and now you're feeling agitated or irritable, or you have rebound insomnia, or an antipsychotic, and there's this sort of cholinergic rebound, mm-hmm. and plus you've started the new drug. But I think the clinician has to be ever mindful of whether the phenomena the patient's reporting are consistent with the natural course of your illness. So maybe you're getting more agitated or anxious because of your illness, or maybe the new drug that I've introduced is having adverse effects, or what were you just on that got stopped? And was there a drug interaction or was there an abrupt discontinuation mm-hmm. phenomenon like from a short half-life antipsychotic or short half-life mm-hmm. serotonergic drug? So these are all the balls in the air that I think one has to be mindful of. And my approach to this is, again, try to change one variable at a time. Don't do two mm-hmm. things on the same day. Yeah. Switching is a particularly vulnerable time. And I, I always feel like in order to switch effectively, you have to understand the pharmacokinetics and the mm-hmm. pharmacodynamics of the outgoing drug and the new drug, as you've been talking about all these different interactions. Which also speaks to the case-by-case part of it. If somebody's been on a drug that's a 2D6 inhibitor and now they're going to go on a 2D6 substrate, that enzyme is shut down. So they're not going to be able to metabolize it as efficiently as if they were not stopping a 2D6 inhibitor. So you have to look very carefully at what the regimen has been and then go through the math, so to speak, of Mm -hmm. are there PK interactions that will bear on the wisdom of an abrupt versus gradual stop. And, and not to mention other confounders like, oh, and you do have eight to 10 beers three times a week. Oh, and you're on a highish dose of a benzodiazepine and other confounders that'll mess up the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. This has been a fascinating discussion and I uh, really appreciate it. Unfortunately, we're out of time right now. Steve, any last words on placebo, nocebo? 
No, just uh, watch your expectancy and help set them. Yeah, I think that managing expectations, I think, is critical, both in a positive way and a negative way. Joe, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would just say, take your time. There's so, so, such a tendency nowadays to rush in and do something. I've often found it really informative in my practice when, when somebody comes in and I just have great concerns about drug tolerability, sensitivities, no SIBO, placebo effects, that the first thing I want to do is just observe. Mm-hmm. And if in the first week, it's almost like the, the, the placebo washings that they do in some clinical mm-hmm. trials. Mm-hmm. So if I do nothing to you on day one and I come back a week later and, oh, I'm so much worse, or my first meeting with you left me feeling optimistic, pessimistic, skeptical, or I, I need to control for the placebo effect in the first week. So when a complicated patient comes along, my, my wisdom here is don't rush to do anything. Get a lot of data in the first week. And then if things are really no better or worse, someone who's had a flight into health, I know you can help me, is different from someone who's PHQ-9 hasn't changed from the prior visit. Mm-hmm. And then you can gradually proceed with whatever you want to do. Yeah, I had a professor who used to say, don't just do something, something stand there. Stand there. Yeah, which is the opposite of what you might think. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I think that's really helpful advice. And I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode of the Psychopharmacology Show, where we've been discussing uh, uh, Dr. Goldberg and Dr. Stahl's new book, Practical Psychopharmacology. And stay tuned because we're going to have two more podcasts in this series. And the next one, part two, is going to be on mediators and moderators of treatment response. I'm really looking forward to it, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andy. And Steve. Bye-bye. This episode was brought to you by NEI Membership. The 2021 NEI Synapse Virtual Half Day Series is included with NEI Membership. Become a member today so that you can register for free for any or all of the monthly half days in which Dr. Stahl and colleagues will spend the last Saturday morning of each month sharing cutting-edge research and clinical insights on the topics most relevant to real-world practice. Don't miss out. Become a member today. Visit www.neiglobal.com to learn more.